Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. On today's show, you will hear stories from Alice Bryant and Brian Lynn. Later, Jill Robbins presents this week's Everyday Grammar Report. We close the program with the next episode of The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Alice Bryant. On pieces of unused land in the Bronx, gardeners from many neighborhoods work together to make more than 12 farm hubs. The Bronx is an area in the northern part of New York City. The gardeners are combining efforts for their community gardens and harvests. Years ago, some found that together their small gardens could grow enough produce to make a lot of hot sauce. So they shared harvests to create a product called Bronx Hot Sauce. Profits from the sales are reinvested in their communities. Throughout the pandemic, the farm hubs of the Bronx have again proven their strength. They are producing leafy green vegetables and root crops like garlic, for example. The trick is, how can we learn from the pandemic so that we become truly resilient? says Raymond Figueroa Reyes. He is president of the New York City Community Garden Coalition. The Bronx's farm hubs are part of an urban gardening movement across the country. The gardeners are seeking to empower their communities by urging them to grow their own food. When the pandemic hit, Urban farming expanded widely and became highly productive. Many urban and rural areas in the U.S. have little access to healthy, fresh food. These areas usually have high rates of disease, such as high blood pressure and diabetes. Millions of Americans live in neighborhoods without healthy food. And unhealthy fast food is everywhere. In cities, some community leaders use terms like food prisons to describe this lack of fresh food as part of deeper issues of race and equity. Ron Finley of Los Angeles has been gardening in the city for several years. He says growing your own food is like printing your own money. Finley runs the nonprofit organization Ron Finley Project. It's not just about food, it's about freedom. It's our revolution, he told the Associated Press. Finley grew up in South Central Los Angeles, where he says he had to drive 45 minutes just to get a fresh tomato. His efforts to rebuild communities through gardening include planting crops on deserted land. Finley says fast food restaurants are killing more people in our communities than guns. When you plant a seed, it will reproduce, he said. It's about currency. It's a valuable resource. That's empowering. It's about more than food. In the Bronx, Karen Washington has spent several years pushing urban farming forward. She helped organize the pepper growing that led to Bronx hot sauce. The company they work with now 
also makes hot sauce with community-grown peppers from other U.S. cities. Healthy food is a human right, along with clean water, Washington said. She is a member of the supervisory group from the New York Botanical Garden and has assisted neighborhoods in starting community gardens. Washington also has helped launch City Farms Market. It brings low-cost fresh fruits and vegetables to a weekly Bronx farmer's market. Washington says COVID-19 made a lot of people want to grow their own food. If we are going to fight viruses, she said, we need to start eating healthy. Figueroa Reyes agrees. He said there is a great effort to organize more farm hubs and get the fresh food to where it is needed most. Through its Bronx Green Up program, or BGU, the New York Botanical Garden has long offered support to community gardens. When the pandemic hit, it organized online meetings to help solve issues. And BGU provided more than 10,000 small herb and vegetable plants. Early in the pandemic, the program leaders realized that food insecurity has always been a big issue in the Bronx, says Ursula Chance. She is the program's director. There's definitely a lot of community gardening interest now and more urban farm spaces, Chance says. I'm Alice Bryant. A group in South Africa's largest township, Soweto, is helping young community members learn kayaking. The Soweto Canoe and Recreation Club offers young people from the mostly black township the chance to gain skills in kayaking and canoeing. The two sports are similar but use different equipment. Traditionally in South Africa, water sports like kayaking are usually only experienced by upper-class members of the country's white minority. But the Canoe and Recreation Club, created in 2003, has aimed to change that. The group currently has 72 members that range in age from 7 to 22. One member is 20-year-old Benjamin Umtaninchi. He spoke to Reuters while taking a kayak down the Clip River, which runs through Soweto Township. The water helps me focus and be alone with my thoughts. When I'm facing challenges in life, I come here, take the boat, and get into the water, he said. Soweto, like South Africa as a whole, suffers from high youth unemployment. The latest national data from June showed that nearly half of young people aged 15 to 34 are unemployed. The club says on its website that it also offers help to members beyond the development of sports skills. These include educational programs designed to aid students in graduating and exploring possibilities for continuing schooling. In addition, the group offers career guidance and employment assistance. Nkosi Mzolo is a coach at the club. 
He said the group has to work to overcome traditional beliefs in the country that evil spirits can live in lakes and rivers. There are still negative connotations attached to children being in the water, Mzolo said. People still believe that there is a supernatural snake that lives in this dam, so kids should not be playing here, he added. Umtaninchi says he successfully overcame those fears. Now he is dreaming of very big things in the sport of kayaking. He says he aims to keep training hard and hopes one day to be good enough to compete in the Olympics. Umtanichi currently ranks second in the under-23 grouping in Gauteng, the area around South Africa's largest city, Johannesburg. The club says it has already produced some of the most exciting up-and-coming paddlers in the country. Among them is Suseko Entondini, who became the first black South African to finish at the top of the Hansa Fish Canoe Marathon in 2015. I'm Brian Lynn. On this program, you have learned about count and non-count nouns. A count noun is something you can count and make plural, as in two trees, five girls, and so on. Non-count nouns are grammatically singular. For example, rice is non-count, but it is made up of many small pieces. You can count glasses of water but you would not normally count waters unless you are talking about the many kinds of water on sale in some markets. We can count songs, but not music, so song is a count noun, while music is a non-count noun. John wrote two songs last week. His band plays New Age music. With the singular form of count nouns, we use a before a word that begins with a consonant sound and an before a word that begins with a vowel sound. There are exceptions, but this rule usually holds true. Here are examples. They have an office on the first floor. I left a banana on the table for you. With the plural form of count nouns, we can use some instead of a or an. Some businesses have closed on my street. I gave her some apples to take to her mother. Now, let us turn to the question of non-count nouns. Can we use a or an? Or must we use some? Consider these examples. You should come inside. There is some bad weather coming. The children asked for some money to buy books. We would not say a weather or a money. The word some is an adjective, meaning an unspecified amount, so it goes well with non-count nouns. Of course, you need not use an adjective or an article with plural nouns. It is interesting to compare the count and non-count nouns for related ideas, like letter, a count noun, and male, a non-count noun. Sandy found a letter from her sister when she pulled some mail out of the box. Another pair of such related words is cloud, a count noun, and weather, a non-count noun. There is not a cloud in the sky, so we should have some dry weather for the party. And every workday here at Learning English, we write a story, count noun, for you about the latest news, a non-count noun. 
The editor asked me to write a story about some news from Asia. To sum up, you can use a or an before singular count nouns, and some before plural count nouns, and any non-count nouns. And that's everyday grammar. I'm Jill Robbins. From VOA Learning English, welcome to the Making of a Nation. I'm Steve Ember. In our last program, we talked about President Thomas Jefferson's decisions about who would be in his new government. Jefferson was the leader of a new political party, the Republican Party. But not the Republican Party we know today. In fact, Jefferson's party laid the roots for today's Democratic Party. During the election of 1800, the Jeffersonian Republicans struggled bitterly with the opposition party, the Federalists. Jefferson won that election. In his inaugural address of 1801, he said he wanted to work with the Federalists for the good of the nation. But he chose no Federalists for his cabinet. All the cabinet officers were strong Republicans. All were loyal to Thomas Jefferson. Once President Jefferson formed his cabinet, he began planning the policies of his administration. Jefferson, of course, thought central government should be almost invisible. Um, he saw its prime role as acting as a sort of referee between the various uh, states, and he wanted to keep it to a minimum. Andrew O'Shaughnessy directs a Center for Jefferson Studies at Monticello, Thomas Jefferson's home in Virginia. He says... Jefferson was especially concerned about the public debt. In the first year of Jefferson's presidency, the government owed millions of dollars. Each year, the debt grew larger because of the interest charged on these loans. Jefferson wanted to balance the budget. Jefferson discussed his financial policy with his two closest advisors. The advisors were Secretary of State James Madison and Treasury Secretary Albert Gallatin. The men agreed that the government must stop spending as much money as it did under former President John Adams. And they agreed that the government must pay its debts as quickly as possible. Albert Gallatin said, We must have a strong policy. The debt must be paid. If we do not do this, our children, our grandchildren, and many generations to come will have to pay for our mistakes. Jefferson began saving money by cutting unnecessary jobs in the executive branch. He reduced the number of ambassadors, and he dismissed all the tax inspectors. Congress would have to take the next steps. Most government offices, Jefferson said, were created by laws of Congress. Congress alone must act on these positions. The citizens of the United States have paid for these jobs with their taxes. It is not right or just for the government to take more than it needs from the people. President Jefferson also wanted to cut taxes on the production and sale of some products, including whiskey and tobacco. He hoped the government could get all the money it needed from import taxes, and from the sale of public lands. 
The Federalists were furious. They warned that Jefferson's financial program would crush the nation. They declared there would be anarchy if Federalist officials were dismissed. Most people, however, were happy. They liked what Jefferson said. They especially liked his plan to cut taxes. Jefferson's biggest critic was his longtime political opponent, Alexander Hamilton. Hamilton had served as the nation's first Treasury Secretary. Now he was a private lawyer in New York City. He published his criticism of Jefferson in a newspaper he started, the New York Evening Post. In Congress, elected officials also debated the president's proposal to cut taxes. Federalists said it was dangerous for the government to depend mainly on import taxes. They said such a policy would lead to smuggling. People would try to bring goods into the United States secretly without paying customs fees on them. Federalists also said that if the United States cut taxes, it would not have enough money to pay its debts. Then no one would want to invest in the United States again. Republicans said they were not afraid of smugglers. The danger, they said, would come from taxing the American people. There was no need for production and sales taxes. And they said the American people knew it. The Republicans also said they were sure the government would have enough money to pay its debts. The Republicans won this legislative fight. Both the Senate and the House of Representatives voted to approve the president's plan to cut taxes. Congress also had another of Jefferson's proposals to debate. Jefferson wanted to reduce the number of federal courts. The issue had roots in the political divisions between the Federalist and Republican parties. And it started in the closing days of the previous president's term. John Adams was a Federalist. Before Adams left office, Congress passed a Judiciary Act. This act gave Adams the power to appoint as many judges as he wished. The act was a way for the Federalists to keep control of one branch of government after losing the presidency and their majority in Congress in the election of 1800. So President Adams quickly created new courts and named new judges. Just as quickly, the Senate approved them. The papers of appointment were signed. The appointed men were known as midnight judges. However, some of the midnight judges did not receive their papers or commissions before Thomas Jefferson was sworn into office. The new president refused to give them their commissions. Federalist congressmen claimed that the president was trying to interfere with the judiciary. This interference, they said, violated the Constitution. Republican congressmen argued that the Constitution gave Congress the power to create and eliminate courts. They said the former administration had no right to appoint the so-called midnight judges. The Republicans won this argument, too. Congress approved President Jefferson's proposal to reduce the federal courts. Congress then turned to other business. But the question of the midnight judges would not die. One reason the issue remained important was because of a man named William Marbury. 
Marbury was one of the midnight judges who had never received his commission. He asked the Supreme Court to decide whether the government was required to give him his commission. The Chief Justice of the United States, John Marshall, was a member of the Federalist Party. Jefferson and Marshall hate each other. In fact, Marshall gives him the oath for the inauguration and goes back to his room and says, well, a terrorist has just taken over the government. I hope we will be able to survive him. Joseph Ellis is a historian who has written many books about early American history. He says John Marshall was a towering figure who had an entirely different view of the federal government than Jefferson. Marshall believed the Supreme Court should have the right to veto bills passed by Congress and signed by the president. In the Marbury case, he saw a chance to put this idea into law. Marshall wrote his decision carefully. First, he said that Marbury did have a legal right to his judicial commission. Then, he said that Marbury had been denied this legal right. He said no one, not even the president, could take away a person's legal rights. Next, Marshall noted that Marbury had taken his request to the Supreme Court under the terms of a law passed in 1789. That law gave citizens the right to ask the high court to order action by any lower court or by any government official. Marshall explained that the Constitution carefully limits the powers of the Supreme Court. The court can hear direct requests involving diplomats or the states. It cannot rule on other cases until a lower court has ruled. So, Marshall said, the 1789 law allowed Marbury to take his case directly to the Supreme Court. But the Constitution did not. The Constitution, he added, is the first law of the land. Therefore, the Congressional law is unconstitutional and has no power. Chief Justice Marshall succeeded in doing all he had hoped to do. He made clear that Marbury had a right to his judicial commission. He also saved himself from a battle with the administration. Most importantly, he claimed for the Supreme Court the power to rule on laws passed by Congress. The case of Marbury v. Madison established that the Supreme Court, not the President or the Congress, has the final say on what the Constitution means. Jefferson did not like Marshall's decision, but Joseph Ellis says that Jefferson was awed by how the Chief Justice argued his case. Jefferson says to his friends, if you ever talk to Marshall, don't say anything, because whatever you say, he will take it and he will twist it. He calls about twistifications of John Marshall. Jefferson waited for the Supreme Court to use this new power to change Congress's laws. Several times during Jefferson's presidency, Federalists claimed that laws passed by the Republican Congress violated the Constitution. But they never asked the Supreme Court to reject those laws. The case of Marbury v. Madison was one of the most important decisions about how America's government operates. But historians say another act during Thomas Jefferson's presidency affected America in an even bigger way. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. Thompson.